Tell a crime yeah. scene story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a gerbil crawling yeah, yeah. out of a guy's ass, something like that. <laughs> I got something close to that. <laughs> not, really? No, no, no. That's fucking hot. All right, so we're back, man. Did I mention how hot it was the first episode? No, I didn't. We're part of a heat wave right now. What is today, July it's 23rd? It's actually cooled down a little bit. Today's though, the 22nd. 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 And we had two Friday and Saturday oh, works. Yeah. Scott and Sunday, too, right? And you're looking at my built-in pool, and you can't even go in it. Is yeah, I didn't wear anything except my tidy whiteies. Can I borrow your shorts? No, you have you, shorts? You ain't going in my pool with Come your tidy whiteies. Come on, man. Let me borrow, I just don't want to watch Let me borrow some of your, a pair of your shorts. What you guys get me into over here? <laughs> I don't care. You don't have to wash them first. <laughs> At least we're not wearing a bulletproof vest and uh, that. Oh. 20 pounds of gear. Oh. Remember, Remember those that? days? Oh, I never... If I, went, if I went to a detail in the summer, I never wore my vest. Oh, I didn't I, care. I, I was like, you know what? Game. Fuck it. Shoot me. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Remember, remember, the, remember the light blue shirts, though. You could tell by the sweat stains. Right? They were always. Oh, you could see the outline of the when vest. When you used to pull your vest out like this, and, and then the steam the would oh, come yeah, out yeah, of your yeah, vest, like you could see it. Pouring that That's how it, how hot it was. Yeah. Oh man, it's. I don't. I, I never want to be that like hot again. I have my guns coming out. Like <laughs> it's amazing what you can get used to, though. <laughs> it is right. You know, like it mentally, is. you had to prepare yourself for being out in the street during this heat in a vest. Yep. Oh, the gun belt too, especially with when we got the uh, the nine millimeters. Yeah, that gun because belt that sucks. one dug it dug oh. into your hip. Yeah, I don't know how guys got. I'm sure if you look at uh, skeletons of of police officers <laughs> who've had ha- have that nine millimeter rig. That's the worst. Digging into their yeah, hip. I guarantee rib you. Like a little notch they, in it. I guarantee you, there's something them wear that in their stupid hip. Stupid thing on their leg for the the. the, the the oh, gas mask. Oh, remember that thing? Did, did that's I, been out I, for a long yeah, time. Yeah, I don't I see think. them wearing that anymore. I never wore any of that. That was crap. a joke. I used to go. I used to show up and they'd yeah, be the looking for that hood. kind yeah, of stuff. The escape hood. Yeah, I got lucky that I never got one, <laughs> but I never wore that. Yeah. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bring it. I, I didn't care. You, I thought you were wearing that as a shower cap. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? The, the gas mask. The escape hood. You know, you pull it over. You remember your head. the gas mask that we used to get? Yeah, that was that. That was it. It was a joke. It wouldn't work anyway. Right. Right. No, I'm not talking about the hood. I'm talking about a different thing. You're talking about the hood that went this way. Yeah, no, 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 no. You pulled it over your head. With the mask yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it only gave you like three minutes worth yeah, of air. Yeah, they said you can like run that. out of the subway as everyone else is dying yeah, around exactly. you. Yeah, you know? exactly. That looks good. A bunch of cops with escape <laughs> hoods yeah. running up the stairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As all these children are dying around <laughs> Thank God you. I have this gas Nuns, mask. Right. Nuns are falling Ooh, that looks dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I have this gas mask. Right. Yeah, excuse well, me, excuse me, pardon me. What do you get to the top call 911? What are you supposed to do? Excuse me, pardon me. how to get to Canal Street. What do we call for this? Do we call a crime scene for this? Well, I was teaching CPR. They had that one of the, the the slides that you see is you open the door and you see two people on the floor. So it's the the scene is set. So it's like one person obviously touched something that had or or let go of a gas. It was about how to deal with people when they go into cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest, when they breathe something in. And then if there's a second body there, that's when you know usually that person went to go help them uh, and they passed out too, which too, is yeah. your sign to close the door and get the fuck out of there. <laughs> <laughs> call somebody. Right. Call crime you know, scene. You know, I, went to this, I went to this apartment one time. I was a young sergeant and I walk inside and this guy's on the bed, DOA. He's got a needle in his arm and his two friends are there, like somber. And this young female cop says, uh, she goes, he's dead, Sarge. And all of a sudden, these two guys perked up and they started doing like the version of junky CPR. Uh-huh. One of them has a cigarette in his mouth with an ash about three inches long. He's going, come on, motherfucker. Come on, motherfucker. Come on. <laughs> I'm like, it was so, f- I mean, the guy's dead. It's not funny. I shouldn't laugh funny. that a- and I'm just picturing the two. The ash drops in the dead guy's face. And I'm like, guys, you know, he's, he's dead. <laughs> I think he's alive. He's still moving. Yeah, give him a minute. He'll, he'll stop. Right. <laughs> so let's get to some cases here. Um, one of the cases that you wanted to talk about that you brought in here was Walter Scott. Tell us, start from the beginning with Walter Scott. Yeah, so the, uh, the Walter Scott shooting was... Uh, Who was Walter is, Scott? Walter Scott was, uh, he was a guy that lived in North Charleston, been in and out. He wasn't like a hardcore perp, like, you know, violent 
offender, but he was like a near, so Charleston, near well. North Carolina. North Charleston, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah, I mean, South Carolina, yeah. So, um, so essentially, everybody's seen the video of this on, on TV, right? There's, there's a black guy running away and a police officer shooting at him, right? And then he goes down. It's, it was... Uh, uh, international case. I had people th- that I work with, uh, you know, in bloodstain pattern in the Netherlands that are mm-hmm. emailing me stuff about the case that they're getting out there and everything. So um, I, I had stu- I, I did some work for Andy Savage. He's an attorney down in in Charleston, North Ca- uh, South Carolina, and he's a character. And it was one of those connections where. Uh, did, did you ever do any media stuff, right? Like, like talking to the media. Remember Joe Jackalone did a lot of media yes, stuff yeah, and all yeah, that. I, I, I started. Some of that you too. did some of that I too, right? Too, but, yeah. but they always get it wrong, right? And, and yeah. like for me, yeah. uh, if they misquote me in the New York Times, and then I'm being cross-examined on a witness stand, they say, "Well, when this happens, don't you do this?" And I say, "No, you don't do that." And then they, "Oh, well, isn't that what you said in this article?" I'm like, "You know, they misquoted me. They they always misquoted me." Right. So I'm, I'm walking through. Uh, this is so. This is right after we had Ferguson, Missouri, right? We had uh, Michael Michael Brown, Michael Brown case, yeah. right? Uh, I got a phone so you're, call. You're, how are you involved in these cases? You're already retired at yeah. this point. Yeah. So you're working privately. Yeah. Your own business, mm-hmm. and these lawyers are hiring you. Yeah. For this uh, forensic expertise. So yeah. you, that, that's why you went down to North Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I was being hired uh, privately. So I, I had met Andy Savage. I got quoted by the New York Times on the Ferguson case. And then I got a phone call from th- this really powerful attorney down in uh, Charleston. And he's like, hey, John, it's Andy Savage. Uh, I saw what you said in the Times. I want I want you to work with me. And so I did a couple cases with him. Right? I, didn't, I didn't realize how many murders there are in Charleston. You know, uh-huh. right? You think about like New York. You see, the homicide squad went down to fifty homicides. That's nothing, but right. you know. So I'm down there in Charleston. He goes, "You got to set up an office here. We don't have anybody down here that does what you do." I see. You can't have that many homicides. I get back home. He's calling me another one. He's got another one. He's got another wow. one. There's all kinds of stuff going on down there. So, uh, so I'd work with Andy, and I saw that video on on the television where this. This guy's African American male's running away from police officer. Pow, pow, pow! Fires eight shots at the guy. The guy goes down. That that looks bad right there. And and first they show a car stop. This is what the TV shows you. They show you a car stop. Then they show the guy running. Then they show him being shot. Then they show the cop going to get a taser. It picks up his taser and drops it down next to the body. Right? I said this is bad. You know, like usually. You, we don't rush to judgment because we know there's so much more to a case than right. what we're ever going to see. How many cases have, of yours have you seen on the news? And you're like, that's not even my case, is it? And then you're like, what? Well, close. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah. so far off. And you notice they make up the, the things they don't know. They just make it up. Don't let the facts get yeah. in the way of a good story, that's you right. know? Yeah. That's right. So, uh, but that one, I, I judged right away. I said, ah, you know. Fuck this guy, this right? Good. This is like, yeah, because everybody's anti-cop. I call that period like the blue scare, where the media was all about cops are just murdering racists. Yeah. That's all they are, right? So, so now in the middle of this, here comes Michael Slager shooting this guy down. And I, so I, I, I took the YouTube video and I emailed it down to Andy. And I'm like, what the fuck's wrong with you guys down there? You know, you can't can't control your cops. <laughs> and he emails me back, this is my case. Get your ass down here, right? So I call him up. And when you go down there, how long you, did you ever set up the office down there? No, I never did, no. But so what do you stay in, a hotel? I stay at Andy's house usually. If and it's how long do you usually go history. down for? I've, I've been down there two, three weeks at a time. Okay. You know? yeah. And then you come back over here to your house over here. Yeah. At, two, right. at 250 an hour. <laughs> well, I was only 175 back oh, then. Oh, man. So you're 175, yeah, but, but, but uh, you're charging well, me eight hours or it's a 24-hour uh, day? No, no, no. I have. You He's know, thinking about stuff. I'm very, I'm very conservative. He's got to have mercy on these attorneys because yeah. they have but, mercy on people. That what they, happens that if you wake up in the middle of the night and you solve the crime? Now you got to <laughs> now you got to write it down. And you open up the case in the middle of the night. Yeah, I mean, I sent him a text and said, "Listen, I'm on the clock." It, well, this case, a lot, a lot of it, I ended up uh, most of my time. I didn't end up charging. Andy paid out of his pocket for all the experts and everything like that. It was. Uh, because we be, we believed in him. Once we saw what really happened. Well, who was you know? he? What did you believe in? Tell us what. So he he was representing Mike Slager. So so Andy used to be the PBA. He's the cop. He, uh, yeah, he's the cop. Okay. Michael Slager. Shooter. Yeah. yeah, the shooter. So uh, Andy used to be the PBA attorney for uh, Charleston. He's very very famous down there. He was Charleston PD's PBA attorney, and he also handled Charleston County and a lot of guys. Right. So uh, so he was well respected by the cops, and so. 
so Slager's attorney, so, so this whole thing happens. Slager gets his PBA attorney. The video hasn't come out yet. He tells his attorney, uh, you know, listen, this is what happened. Uh, t- I had the taser. He took the taser from me, blah, 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 A, B, C, D. He goes, all right. So they go in, and, and the lawyer doesn't even open a folder. He doesn't even write anything down. And, and he goes in there to represent him. And then so that's uh, SLED took the case, which is South Carolina Law Enforcement District, which is their state agency right there, like the— the, the tops it's of like the a special state prosecutor. Yeah, so uh, now they're they're like a state Just investigation. Well, they, now they're trying to make it so that they do all police involved because they don't want they don't want the agency involved to investigate their own. So Sled had the case, and they sit down with the lawyer and Mike, and they do a reenactment, on, and nobody nobody videotapes this thing, nothing, right? So Mike's reenacting it with the investigator that works for the attorney. Nobody took pictures. Nobody did nothing, and then. Uh, Sled says, well, we want to show you a video. And they show him the video, just that clip, like, pow, 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 pow. And the attorney goes to, to Mike. He goes, you're a fucking liar. And he, like, leaves him, like, just walks out on him. And Sled collars him, right? His wife's two weeks away from get, from giving birth, right? So now so now this is what we got. All I have is what I saw in, in the thing. And so I call Andy up. I said, what do you want me to do? And I'm thinking, like, if this is NYPD, this is only a few days after it happened. Uh, that scene is going to be closed. There's going to be bulldozers there. They're going to have like 50 cops sifting every damn grain right. of sand in that place, right? So, uh, so I went down there. I just brought a couple things with me, and uh, I go down there. I said, uh, and he goes, "Come down here. The state's going to give me all the documents." What do you bring with you? It depends on what it is, you know. Like uh, I'm going to go do a scene on Thursday where there was like a stabbing. And a fire and stuff like that. So I'm not going to really bring my my ballistic uh, trajectory rods or any stuff like that because I'm not going to reconstruct a shooting. But pretty much everything else is in play, you know. So I, I you take it a plane. How hard is it to get in a plane with all that stuff? You oh, it's almost impossible. I, I drive. I was driving to Charleston. Okay. Yeah, like a, yeah, it's like a, a scientist. You got test tubes in your yeah, and in everything trunk. that you have looks like a bomb, you know. Like yeah. so, you can't get on a, a plane. Like Everything's just, like a black case. Go do, a, you, <laughs> you look like you're ready to go do a homicide. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a noose. Yeah, some duct tape. A ski mask. <laughs> yeah, what? You, you have weird stuff laying around your house in this yeah. business, right? You know, I, I remember I was walking by this like women's clothing store, and they're like closing sale. Everything's everything must be sold, you know. So I'm like, I go in there. The woman's like, "Can I help you?" You know, I had like a couple of days growth of beard. You know, I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." Uh, selling the mannequins. She's like, "Get the fuck!" I'm like, "No, what, what, what do you want with the mannequins?" I'm like, "Well, sometimes I need to shoot them, and, and you know, if I put bloody clothes on them, <laughs> she's like, because because actually, yeah. when you think about it, when clothes are in 3D, right? So when you examine clothing, you look at it in two dimensions, right? Yeah. So if you got a blood stain over here, and it's laying flat, it's going to look like it's on your back, right. but it's not on your back, and, t- and you don't really realize it until you put it on something right. once so it's filled. Yeah. It's three dimensional, so a mannequin's kind of handy to have, and sometimes. When you're doing uh, a reenactment of something, to have a mannequin that you can put some clothes on, as soon, put as, a they, bloody as, soon as they shoot hear it, who you, you know? are, they want right. to triple the price of the mannequin. Right? <laughs> I tried to buy one for the college once, and they were like, "Yeah, that'll be a thousand. Like, are you out of your yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. mind? I know. And I had the price new. You yeah. know, I said it's cheaper new, you asshole. You know, <laughs> get on Amazon, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I could see, I could imagine girls walking into your apartment and be like, "Whoa, I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. You got mannequins, <laughs> blood stains <laughs> all over the place." <laughs> Blood, it's like a blood cleaning kit. He's like Rocky. He goes in and practices the blood spatter, but with a bat on a piece of meat, you know? And the chicken. Yeah. He's running around. <laughs> Gallons yeah. of cleanup stuff, like blood cleanup stuff. <laughs> Aluminol, right? The luminol. Yeah. yeah. The it's drop, drop cloth. Don't you feel safe? Yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah, so, so, so what happened? You went. Yeah, so, so we were just supposed to. Oh, you went at, down there with your stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't bring that much stuff because he, he said much. we're just going to get some documents. You know, I didn't think the scene would even be released yet. You know, and so I get down there and he goes, they still haven't given me anything. He goes, well, why don't you just go look at the scene? And I'm like, ah, can we get anywhere near that place? He goes, yeah, my investigator will take you there. So I went. I went with this guy. And there's nobody there. There's there's no no tape up, no nothing, right? So I'm like, all right, well, whatever, right? So so uh, all I had was like a point and shoot camera and a couple things. 
and so we take uh, we take an iPad and we put the video up and we do what's called like photogrammetry. Only this is like total amateur stuff, but but photogrammetry is where you take something that exists in a scene and you can actually get some perspective from it, like the relationship from one object to another, right? So I'm so I got the video paused where you see Mike shooting like this, and you could see the branch of a tree, and then you could see a telephone pole, and you could see about where he was standing. I said, all right. I said, I said to the investigator, this guy, Steve Russell, great guy, great guy. And he was a Charleston PD cop. So I go walking over to the walkway where about where Slager was standing. I'm like, all right, you know. I said, oh, there's an alleyway and then there's a bullet hole in that fence over there. So we go over to the bullet hole and we're looking and there's leaves all around the ground and stuff like that. And now I have nothing, no, no paperwork, nothing. I don't know how many bullets they recovered. I don't, I don't know anything. So uh, no autopsy report. I got I got nothing. So we look at the bullet hole. There's like a fence. It's like 90 degree fence. It goes in one corner, goes out the other corner, and the leaves underneath it were like totally undisturbed. And I'm like, you know, like I said, if this was NYPD, this place would have been bulldozed, right? right. So I'm like, I said to Steve, I said, well, you got to take me to your forensic supply store. He goes, oh, we don't have one of those down here. I go. You don't have a Home Depot? <laughs> he goes, oh, Home Depot. All right, yeah. So I go there. You know, you get some dowels. You get like the wheel to do some measurements, some string, and all that stuff. I said we could we could put this all together. So we're starting to figure out the flight path of the of the bullet. And uh, I said to Steve, I go, I, there's got to be something in those leaves right there, right? Because bullet went through two pieces of stockade fence. There was a wall not too far away. Like, I can't understand why these leaves are undisturbed. He goes, I got my son's uh, metal detector in the car. Like for a 15 year old kid, he pulls it out, nine volt battery, you know, Impressed. it's dead, you know, yeah, get another one, put it in there. So we're going through the leaves, beep, beep, beep. Oh, wow. He goes, there's a bullet. Right? And, and I look at this bullet, and it's got, like, uh, striations on it, like it's slid across uh, pavement, right? So it's all, it's all jacked up, this bullet. I go, that's pretty amazing. I said, but that's not the bullet I want. I said, keep looking, right? Beep, beep, beep. There's another bullet. It's perfectly intact, and it's a hollow point, and there's wood in the, in the nose of the hollow point, right? Like it passed through the fence. And then there's white paint on the base of it, right? So, like, if a bullet travels through two, two intermediate targets like that, it becomes destabilized. You're, you're, not, you're right? not picking this shit up till you photograph it, right? Right, exactly, yeah. So we leave it, you know, right, we're you not like, hey, is. look, a bullet. Right, 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 yeah. I, I, I know people are saying, I would have picked it right up! You know, but I know you're <laughs> yeah, a crime yeah. scene guy. You're going to photograph it exactly. before you Yeah, because where it is is very important, yes. you know, to, yeah. in relation to everything else, yeah. So, um, so you think about a football, right? Like, bullets, I always use, like, a football analogy. If, when somebody throws a pass... Uh, and somebody else tips it and the ball starts to tumble, right? So that's what happens when a bullet strikes something. It becomes destabilized and it'll start to tumble. So the white paint on the base of the bullet was significant because it's a white wall across from this fence. So the bullet tumbled, hit the wall, and then bounced back into the leaves, right? So, uh, so we call Andy up and say, hey, we're, we're finding fucking evidence here, you know? And he goes, just, uh, he goes, look, he goes, you got to notify, there's like a protocol. You got to notify the Charleston County sheriffs and they got to notify SLED, right? And uh, then SLED will come down and collect the evidence. He said, so you really, you know, he goes, don't collect anything, you know, kind of put the brakes on it. He goes, but before you notify these guys, just start getting your measurements, get everything you need to do your diagram or whatever you're going to do down there. So we did a couple things. We called the, the county sheriffs. You know, and here we are. They don't want to get involved in this shit now, right? Uh, well, well, no, they were actually pretty good. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Because uh, I run into this a lot. Like, right? It's like, oh, you work for the fucking defense now. It's You're like, from New York. You know? Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, forget about it. Right down there. So, uh, but the thing yeah, is, like, you, forensics. What's good about that is, no matter what. You're trying to find the truth, right? Because like, I've had so many cases where a guy calls me up. Hey, my guy said this didn't happen. And I'm like, listen, let me just look at it and I'll do my analysis. You tell me what he said later. So, all right, what's your guy say? He says... A, B, C, D. I'm like, he's full of shit, you know? So, I mean, it, it, what, it is what it is, you know? And so, technically, like, a, a true crime scene guy will have the same story, whether he's working for the prosecution or for well, the defense. Well, you know, defense. because so, physical evidence doesn't lie. Exactly. People do. Right, right. right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're down there. We're looking for this evidence. So, we find this evidence. Charleston County shows up. 
And uh, yeah, who are you? Oh, I'm, trying, I'm retired NYPD. Yeah, yeah. Well, who are you working for? Andy Savage. Oh, Andy, he's a good guy. Yeah, I had a shooting. He represented me. So I had like a, a good uh, acceptance with these guys. And Steve knew the guys too. He was a Charleston guy. Um, so now sled comes down and I'm taking my measurements, whatever pictures I needed to take to start, start doing a diagram. And, uh, they're like, would you consent to a, you know, giving us a DNA swab? I said, yeah, you know what they said, write a statement for what happened. So I wrote up how we found the bullets and stuff like that. And so then we get the paperwork, uh, a couple hey, weeks later. Why did they want a DNA swab from you? Well, it, they said, did you touch it, you know? And I was like, no, I didn't actually didn't because I, I had flags, you know, those flags for your garden, you know? And they, yeah, they yeah. Made, so they were two evidence markers. So I put them, you know, but they were, so eventually I did give them to a DNA check swap. check cross-contamination, yeah. see if you Yeah, exactly, yeah. right. Did you right. do it? But not at you that point, it? but I did later on, right? Were so you, uh, Were you arrested for a murder <laughs> after that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, when you think about yeah. it, right? If your DNA ever ended up in CODIS, think about before DNA was even out there, yeah. how many crime scenes we probably left our DNA at, oh, right? Yes. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I, I used to tell guys that, say, listen, you, Everyone. if you touch something, you can explain it, you know? So if your DNA is at a crime scene, you could probably explain it, unless it's like semen or something, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Then, then, then you got a problem, right? But... Uh, so, so now sled I comes. I explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so sled comes and and uh, you know I talked to them. They were they were cordial with me and everything. And then we we get the documents and I'm reading through the documents and they said they did A B C D. Starting to look at some of uh, the stuff they did. They only they didn't find one bullet. They never canvassed the area. Never never knocked on anybody's door. So here's a shooting that's going on. Eight shots are fired. Don't you want to see if, like, Granny get, took a bullet through the window? Right? Yeah, police involved shooting. That's a shitty investigation. It, it's Horrendous. It gets worse and worse. Horrendous. It gets worse and worse. They, and, and they could have done this guy such a big favor if they did, if they did everything. Because... Uh, so I'll go through, like, a little, little by little, right? So, so now I look and I see... Uh, that they were at the crime scene, the FBI, the solicitor's office, solicitor's a prosecutor down there, solicitor's office, SLED, the local PD, whatever. And uh, the solicitor says, oh, the next move we're going to do, uh, aerial photos, right? So, and I remember when I was there, there was a photographer for the New York Times there, and then there was a helicopter flying around. But it was such a big media story. I'm like, all right, they're probably all with the media or whatever. So, uh, so now uh, I see that they, were, they decided to take aerial photos. And I said to Andy, I said, you got to get me that disc of aerial photos. So when we get the disc of the aerial photos, I'm looking. And there's me and Steve on the ground finding their fucking evidence while they're in a helicopter flying around. Like they just sort of – and from the prosecutor's standpoint, how do you get better than that video? Right? How, yeah, how do you get better they, than the guy running right. away getting shot at? Right. You know, so you, they really didn't want to go dig too deep into this case. So, uh, so now – uh, if you read Slager's statements, he never made a report. If you, and then if you look at the early news reports, they say, oh, he, he, uh, he lied on his report. He lied on his report. He never made a report, never even wrote a report. But he made statements to his supervisors. And he said, so, so what happens is he leaves his car, like Walter Scott, he, he does a car stop. And you can hear on his body mic and everything, very professional. He's like, how you doing? I'm Officer Slager from North Charleston Police Department. Can I see your license for registration? And Walter Scott's like, like I said, he's a ne'er-do-well. He's not like, you know, a hardcore perp, but, you know, he's done some stuff. He's been fired from a lot of jobs, Coast Guard, everything for cocaine use, all this stuff. So he's scrambling because he's got no insurance card. He's, you know, the car is totally illegal. But Mike gets his, his uh, driver's license from him. Doesn't even know if it's him anyway. So he takes off running. And Mike says, stop or I'll tase you. And you can hear it very clearly. And then he says, taser, taser, taser. That's exactly what their training is. And if you know Mike, he's like a robot. Everything, everything in his life is like, you know, methodical, according to procedure, you know. So he does taser, taser, taser. Boom, he shoots the first cartridge. So the taser works with the cartridge. It's not like the taser we had, that big thing that was like the size of a microwave where yeah, there was yeah, two yeah. things, you know. So he puts the cartridge on and he fires and it's total miss, right? What happens is when that cartridge is deployed, there's little pieces of confetti, right, called uh, aphids that, that come out of the cartridge and they're all over the ground. So now you can get an idea where the first taser shot took place. Takes that cartridge off, puts another cartridge on, fires it. Walter Scott goes down, right? But before he fires the first cartridge, Walter Scott's going like this behind him. It's called, they call it the windshield wiper, 
right? And that's to defeat the taser. You might be get lucky and knock the darts out yeah. before they hit you. So this another way to defeat the taser is to uh, dive to the ground, right? So he fires a second one. He goes to the ground. It was proved that he was never tased with never the, with the darts. He, he had one dart in him from the second one. But not, nothing from the first one. So he was never getting zapped. So Mike says, I fired the two cartridges, and then I used the taser to drive stun him. Right, right. If you take the cartridge off, then it's like a stun gun. You got the two prongs on there and stuff. Does the taser have something inside of it that can find you? Uh, some, well, so, I don't know if it has a GPS. Like, I know the new ones. No, I mean, ones, like, uh, you know, like a, it sounds stupid, but like a heat-seeking missile or something. Oh, like no, that, nothing that, like that, yeah. Because they always seem to hit their target. And a lot of times... It's always like they're always rubbing, running away from chubby cops. And like the guy can't catch the guy, but yeah. he still manages to hit him with the taser. Right, right. Well, it's I'm always like, like there's got to be something. Though, right? uh, it's 20, it's, uh, yeah, I think they, these had like a 25 foot wow, uh, core or something like that. Yeah. Law enforcement's come a long way since my days as a soldier. And now they have cameras on them. Wow. Yeah, but it looks, oh, the taser? unfortunately for him. The tasers have cameras on them. Yeah, if his had a camera on it. We wouldn't even be talking about this case, you know? So what happened? He hit the ground. So he hits the ground. And Mike says, I used it, he goes, another one or two times to, to drive Dri stun him. Drive and, stun and then him. he took the taser away from me, right? Mm -hmm. And he was coming at me with it. And, and then he said, and as I was, and his, t his, his holster is defective. So he's trying to break his gun out of the holster. And that takes a couple seconds. And he said, as I was starting to shoot, he was turning to his left, which is, and if you, if you read what the statement to sled, it perfect. He says, then he, he goes, I was firing two to three seconds. It was like 2.6 seconds. He's firing. He said he took 10 to 13 steps. I think he took like, like 12 steps. It was, it, it was all, you know, nothing was being, you know, uh, covered up or hidden. And this is before the, he knew the, the video. The evidence was verified what he said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what you're trying before to say. he knew this was even on video. Right. But so, so we we'll go back to the he, tape. He's shooting at him, and now he's already drawn his weapon, the fire. Right, rod. right. So because he said that Walter Scott had his taser and he was coming okay. at him to, to right. tase him with it, right? So uh, and and they're taught, but you know what? This is one of those things where it's like kind of off the record. It's not really in any protocol. But if somebody takes your your taser, you shoot them. You know, that's what that's what they're these guys. That. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now he, according to him, what the state's saying, it never happened. Walter Scott has his taser. So if you look at his statements, there's four activations of the taser: two cartridges and one or two drive stuns. Right now, the taser has a chip in it that actually records everything wow. and it'll give you the time it's pretty amazing. right yeah, and so like i said he's he's he is mr procedure right so if you look at like seven o'clock in the morning when he starts his tour there's a two second activation of the taser that's just to test it right so you're supposed to do that at the start of every tour if you pulled everybody's taser and saw if they were testing him how many guys do you think would really probably test not many it? but he, yeah. he does that he tests it right and uh, puts the cartridge on, puts it in his holster. Then you start to see around the time of the incident, you see one deployment, right? And then there's like another eight seconds, and then there's another deployment. And then there's even less time, like five seconds, and then, then another one, and then another one, right? And then there's like 30-something seconds that, that elapse on this time card. And he's describing a fight happening where Walter Scott is taking the taser from him during the fight. And then after that 30 something seconds, you see the taser activated two more times. Wow. Right. So, so here we have somebody else activating the tasers. Certainly, it certainly supports what he's saying. I can't say that we have someone else activating the taser. It's being activated again outside of his knowledge that it was even activated, right. you know, because think about it, when you're in these, uh, you have that, what they call uh, SNS response, sympathetic nerve system response to a traumatic situation, you lose your peripheral vision, you lose your hearing and all that stuff. It's just one of those, like if you've ever been in a car accident where it's like slow motion, Tunnel vision. right? Yeah, exactly. You know, so he's going through that, you know, and he's, all he's thinking is my wife's going to have a baby and like, here I am fighting with this guy and he, now he's got my weapon, you know, so, uh, so Walter Scott's turning and he's firing. And he goes down, right? Then, uh, then, then Mike says uh, he doesn't even remember. He goes and picks up the taser, right? You, you could see when he when Walter Scott goes down, he's yelling at him, "Put your hands behind your back! Put your hands behind your back!" Right? And he handcuffs him, and then he's looking around for the taser, and then he looks back. 
towards where they were, and he sees it on the ground. So he runs and he gets it, and he comes over to the body, and he just drops it on the ground from the camera angle. So that right? looks bad for him. It looks bad, but, but see, bad. like, if I put this, these two fingers like this to you, right, they look really close together. But then if you look at them sideways, right, they look further apart, mm -hmm. right? So from the camera angle, the... Uh, it looked like he dropped it right near the body, but it wasn't near the body. It was actually a good distance from the body. So, so to the untrained and not knowing what happened, is it looks like he was planting, He's planting the, taser the taser on right. him. Right, yeah. but he, but they don't. This is what the news doesn't show you. Twenty seconds later, he picks it up and puts it in the holster. Right, and never once ever did he say, "I found the taser right there near the body." He never ever said right. that. Right. So uh, then he describes like being punched, and we had this doctor on board with us who's an expert in tasers, and he, he invented some stuff for a defibrillator, right? He's like a, an expert with uh, electricity in the human body. And he says if he felt like he was punched, he might have been tased, you know? And so I, I said to uh, his father, right, Tom Slager, I said, Tom, I go, can you get me a uniform shirt? That's the same, uh, that was worn the same amount of times and washed the same amount of times, and you know, as the one he was wearing that day. And, and Tom goes, yeah, I could do that for you. So he gets me a shirt, and uh, actually in a hotel room right there, uh, Dateline was with us. They were doing a they were going to cover this whole case, but then they started playing, NBC played so many games they they made up outright lies about the case. Uh, you know that and is we call, so disturbing. I have video I have video. I have emails. Yeah, it's with disturbing. Them admitting it. Sorry, we'll take that video down. And they know that. Sorry, yeah, because they're, yeah. They're, they're trying to prove their narrative that's false. Right, exactly. That so really makes me sick. They're creating the story yeah. rather than uh, yeah. reporting on what's actually happening. They're just trying, well, to, trying know, to steer just, it in a direction. We, we uh, had a direction. homicide case. This girl, Connie Lung, and this other guy, Eric Lewis, they killed her parents and they dumped them in the East River. Connie was Asian and Eric was black. All these re homicide recreation shows want to do the show because they want to do the the black Asian angle and that this, and I told them there was none. The parents did not like her boyfriend because he was black. Right. They did not like her boyfriend because he was a loser. Right. And when they hear I won't do that angle, they don't want nothing to do with the yeah. case anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. The truth uh, doesn't fit their narrative. No, it doesn't fit know? their narrative. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, uh, so we had Dateline with us. We were in a hotel. I was putting a bunch of experts together for Andy. He came in to Brooklyn. We had a hotel and room, and we're going through all this stuff. And we had this guy, Gene Maloney. I don't know if you know him from the range. He was an NYPD guy. He worked at the range, did a lot of instruction there for a long time. And he brought a taser. And I said to Gene, I go, does, taser, does a taser leave marks on, a, on clothing when you fire it, you know, like a, dr a drive stun? He goes, I don't know. So we took one of Andy's undershirts, and, and we zapped it, you know. I'm like, wow, it does. You could actually see two marks there. So I, that's why I said to his father, get me the same uniform shirt. I want something, because like in, in forensics, you know, a brand new shirt, you ever you ever spill coffee on a brand new pair of khakis and you're like, oh, fuck. And then you look and it, it beat it off and you're like, yeah. oh, that was cool. Because like when when it's an article of clothing is new, it could be treated with something. Right. And that can affect the way blood gets absorbed into it. So, so if you want, uh, so the history of the garment is very important. So I wanted a, a garment with a similar history. So his father gets me the same kind of shirt. I get Gene over to my office. I said, let's zap this shirt. So we zap it and it's, you know, dark, dark blue like our shirt were right like this kind of blue and so you look and you can't see anything but i used a, uh, an, an infrared camera right and the the dye on the shirt reflects the infrared wavelengths but it, uh so you can actually i could make your shirt look white you know if the depending on the type of dye that's used this shirt i could if there was blood on it i could find it right away using infrared photography so with the infrared photography i was able to see where he zapped the shirt. I was like, wow, that's cool. All right. So I was like, here, zap it here, zap it there. And every time I was able to find it, I said, I'm going to leave the office, put two like in an X like this and, uh, and don't tell me where it is. So I came back in and I scanned the whole shirt and I was like, all right, it's over the left pocket. He goes, yeah, you're right. So uh, then I started to study the, what the marks were like, because when you think about it, you got two fixed points, right? Two prongs from this drive stun. So they're a certain distance apart. It was like three and a half centimeters, right? So every time I did it, it was approximately three and a half centimeters. So if the shirt stretched a little bit, you think about you're in a fight, right? The shirt might be stretched. And then when you, the tension's off of it, they'd be closer together. So, but within that range is very important. 
The bottom one was about a millimeter in diameter, and the top one was a little bit smaller. And the doctor explained to me that because the current travels from the bottom to the top, right? So, and, and then another thing is, like, if you think about the weave, if you think about it in three dimension, if you zoomed in really close on that shirt, you'd see the fibers, you know, the, the threads in that sure, shirt are sure, overlapping yeah. each other. So a weave is three dimensional. Right, and all the damage was on the bottom part of the weave, right? Which makes sense because the top part is in contact with the probe of, of the taser, and the bottom part is where the, the electricity is going to take off to. It's like the path of least resistance, right? <clears throat> so I'm looking, I'm getting all these characteristics of these two taser marks, and then I finally was able to go to sled and just uh, look at the shirt, you know, and look at. Well, I just wanted to look at some all the evidence that they had there, you know. And that was my thing was I, I had this infrared camera. And uh, so now, were, you, were you telling them your findings or you weren't telling them your findings? I wasn't telling them, wasn't shit, telling them bro. shit, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was telling them shit. The prosecution, they, yeah. this is going to knock their shit right out of the water. Right. right? You know? Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. So I go down there and I brought an alternate light source, too, because you think about your wrestling, maybe there's saliva. If you got Walter Scott saliva on his back, maybe I could find, I don't know. So it was, it, you got to go in with an open mind and just look for everything. So I go, I start opening my kit to take the alternate light source out, you know, like that UV light and all yeah, that sure. stuff, right? It doesn't work as well as it does on TV, but, but it works for a lot of different things. And they go, oh, you can't use that. You, you can't use that. That's, that's an analysis. You're not here to analyze the clothing. I'm like, I thought I was, you know, and they're like, no. So now, now it's back and forth, lawyer and this and that. And he's like, look, just do what you got to do. Just take your pictures. And I said, all right. So, uh. So I take the ice. I'm like, I could use this camera, right? And they're like, yeah, whatever camera. It's an infrared camera. It's even a much better analysis than the... Uh, <laughs> All these shit kickers never knew what that... Yeah, I never saw one of those infrared cameras. <laughs> that wise guy from New York City brought one of those infrared yeah, right. cameras. Yeah. <laughs> Buford, go get me a hot dog. <laughs> he had a salami in the case with the damn uh, camera, you know? Yeah, so, so, I, take a, so I take a picture... And I'm like, let me, I, I said, I'm just going to make sure that this, the, that the camera's functioning. I had my laptop and I put it in the laptop, the card, and I look, and the first thing I see is two marks. And I know taser mark now, because I've done it like a hundred times already. And I, it was like, uh, you heard of buck fever for guys that go hunting when they see like a buck with the eight points and it, you know, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I'm like, so he got taken. So, uh. Well, so so now I'm seeing you know marks consistent with what I know to be a taser mark, right? And so I, so I'm telling Andy, I'm like, this is this is serious stuff. And so like a, like a, a week or so before the trial, he goes write a report about what you did, tell me everything that you did. I'm like, all right. And I give it to him. He goes, I'm going to the solicitor's office and I'm going to give it to her. I'm like, no, don't do that. But but when you think about it, like, uh, so I was pretty much like out of all the people I know, I'm the first person to ever do that, to ever use an infrared camera to find damage to a shirt. All right, don't try to taste. raise your feet at 300 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure like 100 people already wrote it up like it's their idea, you know, right? So, uh, so but the, the trouble with that is now it's not really, you know, the science can come under fire. Right, you know course. what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah, well, you're the first guy to do this. How do we know it's any good? Does it really work? And like, so even though I have all this I'm criteria that I'm working for. Henry you know? Lee, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I, I'm like, I'm like, don't give her, don't give her this information. What's wrong with you? He goes, I just, it's the right thing to do, John. He goes, uh, I think it's going to, I mean, Andy's a brilliant strategist. So he gives her this thing and she flips out. Right. And she she gives uh, gives it to her laboratory and they go in and they had her, they they figured out I was using an infrared camera because yes. I also use a different camera uh, to, to take other like, you know, normal light. White, white, white light pictures, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So they took some infrared pictures, but I don't think they knew what the hell they were looking for. Like, like how can you take pictures of a shirt and, and you don't even zap your own shirt with a taser? Like eventually they they started zapping his shirt with they a taser. Figured it out, they figured yeah. it out. And, but then, so what they did after that was they did a microscopic analysis of the shirt to look and see what the damage looked like, right? And uh, what was happening was they were, you, you would see melted fibers. So when they analyzed Mike's shirt, the actual shirt he was wearing that day, they found melted fibers. They said, we can't rule out a taser as being the heat source of, that caused this, you know. So now Andy had a lot to work with. When I took pictures with the infrared, you, you can actually see through pockets and stuff. Wow. I'm, I'm looking at the left breast pocket of his shirt, and there's like a notebook in there. Like, didn't anybody bother to 
fucking look through the shirt. Like, like I said, it was like, as soon as that video came out, just put everything on a shelf. Don't sure. worry. This is all we need. Pow, 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 pow. Right. So, uh, yeah. So we, so we had that evidence now. And then if you look at the, the FBI video, right, they did an enhancement on it. You'll see Walter Scott's right arm coming up and Mike stops his, his arm and you'll see the taser tumbling behind them in the same trajectory as if he either threw it yeah. out of his hand or, uh, or, you know, he was coming up to zap him again and the, and the taser fell out of his hand. But how is the taser, you know, they, they said, oh, he, he just decided, like, Walter Scott, at this point, he's got his, his right arm like this, right, and he's starting to turn to the left. And, and uh, the state's theory was, no, he Slager threw the taser. He was tired of the taser, and he said, I'm just going to shoot this motherfucker. Oh, yeah, this yeah, you know? So he threw the taser down, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like, that makes, that, like, that makes sense, you know? So, uh, yeah, so with that and a, and a whole bunch of other stuff, we did an audio enhancement of his body mic, and you can hear Walter Scott when he says, you know, get on the ground. He says, fuck police, right? And this is the guy, like, he, he's like a saint in the media, if yes, you look. Yeah, they, he's great. They, he's they put his, uh, The gentle yeah, giant. They, another right, gentle giant. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they couldn't get away with the sixth grade graduation picture because he yeah. was 50 years old, but, yeah. they, but they bring out his Coast Guard picture. Yeah. But they forget to mention that he got thrown well, out of the Coast Guard for, the for Coast cocaine Guard. Yeah. use, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, this is him doing a line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? In his Coast Guard uniform. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, so what happened with the case? Well, we... On a state level, we hung the jury, right? So all 12 said it's not murder. All 12. And they said it's not a racial thing. And uh, 7 to 12 wanted to acquit on manslaughter, but they couldn't make up their mind. But in the meantime, the feds, this was under the Obama, you know, oh. uh, DOJ, right, which we see what, they, what they're capable of. Yeah. You know, if he says, get this guy for this, they're going to get that guy for that. Or get her off for doing this, they're gonna, right? That's, that's that DOJ. So they, uh, I don't want to get political here. But uh, anyway, so they weaved this web of charges against them, where every single charge had an underlying charge of murder. So if he pl- took a plea for spitting in the street, he could also get 30 years for murder, right? So, uh, but when all the facts uh, came out and then there was like a, a pre-sentencing recommendation, I think he was supposed to get like 12 years and he had already done a bunch of time. He, you know, he went up for, so this happened April 4th of 2015. They didn't do his uh, a bail hearing until September 11th of 2015, right? So he's in jail all the time. His son's brand new baby boy, never got to hold him, you know? Uh, and then the judge didn't. And, and so that day, uh, Andy had a whole setup at his house with the that was catered with with a priest to to baptize the baby and and everything to welcome him home from jail and the judge said no I'm I'm going to deny him bail he's a threat to the community right a guy who was on patrol for 5 years you know uh so so anyway uh so because the federal case was very dangerous it was like a landmine trying to get through that you know and Andy said look he goes if if you get convicted of just the littlest offense, he said it was seven to five on voluntary manslaughter. And a lot of those juries that voted to acquit him on voluntary manslaughter said that they might have got him for involuntary manslaughter. So, uh, which is a much lesser, much charge. lesser charge. Yeah. 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 But so, but if, if there was a similar charge in the federal level, he could still get the 30 years for the murder, you know? So it was, it was a, yeah, it was a, a real, uh, so it what, was, it where, was a hip job. Where is That's he what today? it was. Where is he today? He's in Colorado. He's in prison. Uh, He's still in prison? Yeah. He got 20 years. The judge gave him 20 years, you know? Um, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. His son, uh, his wife moved out there with the son. So he sees his son on occasion, uh, He's in a, a decent facility. It's not a bad, you know, it's not, it's because yeah, it's federal. You're in prison, you know? though. You're in know? prison, yeah. man, yeah. He's actually, uh, th- there's like a camp portion of the prison that he's not in. He's in like the regular population, whatever. Uh, and that's where Blagojevich is. Remember uh, Blago yeah, from the, uh, the, the nice haircut? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. From, from uh, he, he was, was he was the governor of Illinois. Yeah, and, he was and uh, tried pay. to sell Obama's uh, Senate seat. Senate no, seat. Yeah, 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 that's good. That was excellent. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it's so amazing. He didn't, so he didn't get off. I mean, you, you yeah, they, well, you lightened the load, but he, he didn't yeah. get off. Right. Yeah. Well, even the, the the Michael Brown case, look at what the press did with that. Yeah. Right? Until they started finding out the truth. And the truth takes time to find out. Exactly. You know what I mean? Sure. And the fact that, like, the physical evidence, like the, the uh, spent cartridges were inside the car, 
and the fact that there was blood inside the car and all that. No one wanted to hear that. And yeah. the whole thing with the hands up, don't sh- don't shoot. That never happened. That never happened. It was that never happened. Lie. But the yeah. press reported that like that was gospel. Yeah. Pro football players were uh, doing those protests, right. and it, it never ever happened. Putting their hands. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that unbelievable? It's, yeah. It's disturbing what the press th- th- can do with these it, cases. You, you know? got to look at it this way: it's a business, right? And the more pissed off and afraid they can make people, the more business they're going to get. Because yeah. now what are you going to do? You're going to go out to the streets and start a riot. You're going to have a protest and people are going to break windows. So it's more news. So you're actually creating more business with the more fear you can instill in people. The scary, scary part though. is that we're at a certain age right now where we see this. You know, we're old enough to watch, watch the plays unravel, you yeah. know, you'd like a football, you're, you're a quarterback, and you can see what really happened. You could decipher it. Plus, we have law enforcement experience. For the average civilian, especially the young people, they just they, they don't want to work that hard to find their news. They just take it verbatim. Yeah. We went through that with blinders for our most of our lives. Think about all the stories that we thought about when we were younger, you know, uh, really high profile. A couple of them we've had. Michael uh, O'Keefe. Exactly. Yeah. Look and the lies. And, but you believe it. Unless you have family involved, uh, family that's law enforcement or your law enforcement or just a buff. You're always going to, the part of you is going to side with what you're watching in the news because they're telling me the truth. And now on a daily basis, we're seeing that, no, they just lie to us on a daily basis. They make yeah. up parts, <laughs> parts that they don't know. I used to love that on the, you know, we, I know the case like the back of my hand. Yeah. And parts that they didn't know, they would just simply make it right. up. Where'd you Look, get this? It's, yeah. Listen, yeah. It's, it's one thing to read an article in a newspaper the, the day after a crime, a murder. Right, because you just who's no the cops aren't talking to you, you're getting piecing it together from people in the street that want to tell you anything. So well, I get it, you'll right. get it, you'll get some leeway. But if you're doing a 2020 expo, a 60 minute expo, and you're still getting it wrong because you you you're choosing to overlook evidence or not talk well, to somebody, to slant it one way or another because that's the narrative they want. Look, one of the things I hated about the NYPD was that their policy under Ray Kelly was to give the press everything. Yeah. And it was like, why are we telling them this? How are we going to get suspects? There's nothing secret about this case. So if we get somebody and he's going to bullshit us, we can't. We have nothing that they don't know that wasn't out there in the press. But that was still their policy. Oh, yeah. let them know. Yeah, he always wanted the gun, Kelly. Like whenever we got yeah, to he a, pose a, with a the big, gun. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's you know how that fucked up our crime scenes, though, right? Like uh, we don't get some like right. spectacle. He'd want to pose uh, with the gun. Commissioner wants the gun. We're like we're, we're nowhere near getting to that gun. Oh, yeah, too bad. We're going to get it. Like you know, it's not even rendered safe. Oh, what are you going to go pick that thing yeah, up? Yeah, so it's he like, could pose with it. 11:45. Why? So they can do a press conference yeah, yeah, with the, yeah, the yeah, actual exactly. firearm. Yeah. And also, how about a defense? Did they bring it attorney? back when they were done and put it back? <laughs> we, in the I, I tell them fume, fume it and swab it anyway. I don't go far, you know, right? <laughs> right. Think of how that hurts you as the it chain of custody. Kills it. Yeah. The commission is going to need this for a little while. We'll bring yeah. it back in an hour. Where he was it again? Oh, yeah, it was over here. He'd be on the scene like like this, you know. Like I, my favorite story with that was we had the um, a case uh, with this prostitute and her boyfriend uh, killed this Holocaust survivor on the East Side. Uh, Felix Brinkman was his name. And that mo- one morning, we had all the perps I did because there was more than those two involved. And DCPI calls me, Deputy Commissioner of Public Information. They say, what's going on with the case? I said, we have good news. We got everyone I did. We're going out to get them uh, in, a, in about an hour. The guy says, yeah? Like, what do you mean, yeah? He goes, what's their names? I said, I'm not telling you their names. And this little bucket... De- a, a detective, <laughs> little suck boy, hands the phone to an inspector who starts screaming at me, Who are you to tell me or not? I said, Inspector. And I made it up right on the spot. I said, Chief Matarasso ordered me not to tell you. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's so pissed because now he has the chief bitch slapping him. You know, right. that wasn't true. I lied to him. But <laughs> I didn't need them giving the names of the perps to the press. And then we we won't get a confession because they'll lawyer right up when right. we get them. Yep. That's so we great. got them. They all confessed. Now you can have their names, your dickheads at one PP. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, I gotta ask you this, okay? So you were you were an expert on the crime scenes. Now, there's a lot of mistakes. So some young officers, maybe even some veteran officers, detectives, investigators, bosses. They, they're still making mistakes at crime scene. Can you give us like a little list of things not to do, no matter how obvious they are, what <laughs> not to do when you arrive at a crime scene uh, so you don't destroy it? Uh, well, Especially for departments that don't get that many homicides. Right. Don't get that many shootings. 
What are some things? Well, some things that they give us both sides. Give us the things. Definitely don't do this, and you should probably do this. Just right. simple stuff. Uh, that's tough because, like I said, every every single scene is unique. You know, uh, be careful. Well, let's say it's a shooting. Yeah, um, you get the body's there, perp is gone. Mm-hmm. No, let's say it's in, a, in, in an apartment, okay. in a house. Yeah, They're like what? What is the thing? You know, obviously there's some things that are so obvious, but these people still do them. Like, should I be smoking it? Nobody smokes anymore, but should I be smoking a cigarette inside the crime scene? <laughs> no. Huh? Remember, remember like burning coffee on the stove to get the smell out? No, you like, shouldn't uh, do that? No, nah, nah, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I remember- the Body I, was ripe, though. I remember in the, in the 5-0 one time, and I was looking for uh, some, some ballistic evidence, and I was like, there's a couple of the guys from the squad standing there, you know- uh, I says, I, I think that's a piece of bullet jacket. The guy's almost stepping on it. And he goes, oh, yeah. And he pulls a pen out. And he's like, think, 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 think. He's like, yeah, I think it's copper. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm you're looking for microscopic little striations on that thing. Bah, bah, bah. So you don't want to do that. How about you coffee? Want- Can you have coffee inside the crime scene? I would bring coffee. It depends on the, it depends on the scene. You know, I mean, uh-huh. some, sometimes, you, you know. It, it depends on the scene. An outdoor scene, you know, like if I'm the boss and I'm standing in the shadows, I have a cup of coffee. You know, in my John, possibly, even you know, even like- our protocol is like you know to protect the crime scene. So who do they put to protect it? A rookie cop with about 22 <laughs> seconds on the job who's yeah. going to go, Chief, what's your shield and tax <laughs> number? Like he's going to yeah. just bit slap this little you know newbie. Does yeah, that yeah. work? Does well, putting the I know they have to give out their shield numbers or their command. Well, actually, Chief that don't deters have shield numbers. some bosses. Well, you, but, know, you know what used to work was uh, you take the camera out, you know, because that, that was a big deal was trying to clear your crime scene, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, listen, you know how it is when you get there, especially uh, what, what's, to go into the crime everybody's scene, yeah. there. Every, they're all there. So right? if you take the camera yeah, out, nobody wants to be on film. Right, right. You just start so like, aiming at the people out. and they start scattering like roaches when the lights come on. Or uh, or, or you just say <laughs> like, uh, like, listen, if any, anybody who's in here, you pull some swabs out. Like, I'm just going to need a DNA sample, you know? Oh, <laughs> man. Oh, yeah, forget yeah, it. Where'd everybody God, go? Right? You know, yeah. Or, or, but the best thing is like the chief would always come in. Not, not like, you know, chief of the detective chief you know they usually uh chief from patrol yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah they come in uh, so and and they always had an entourage so uh i'd, I'd use sort of like the aikido method you know like you, you use their their force against themselves you know i'd say chief i'm glad you're here you know i got, <laughs> I got so many <laughs> so, uh, there's I got so many vouchers <laughs> just tell them like, I, I, I got so many unauthorized people in my crime scene can i borrow your authority just to kick and you know, oh yeah hey hey you guys get out of here you know crime yeah. scene's got to come and then he realizes, hey, my dumb ass is in here too. And uh, all right, you got it, Sarge. Yeah, I got it, Chief. Thank you very much. You know? Everyone is who's in here is going to have to testify. <laughs> yeah, right. You're all on camera. That's Make the- sure all your memory books are up to date. That's right. Uh, That's right. I got a funny story about that. Uh, did you work the, the Dr. Cox case? Remember that doctor that said he got acid poured on him in a robbery? I didn't. No, you know what I'm talking about, though? I there, there was it, like yeah. this doctor. He was the plastic surgeon to the stars, right? He's a, a 80-something year old guy. And apparently he just had a brain fart and got into a really uh, a tub that had like boiling water in it but and so he's like oh shit you know i gotta make this look good for myself so he makes up a story that he got robbed and the perps threw acid on him right but then if you look at the body sheet like he's got burns from here was he drunk no, nah, he was old, man. And so, so How deep can you get in? Well, I guess you put your one foot, then you, you ever, slip you ever in? Stick, you ever stick your hand in really hot water? At first, it feels almost cold. It's like, uh, oh. I don't know. So I don't know. But, but So we're looking through his... He ends up dying, right? He goes out of the picture. And, From uh, that? Yeah. That yeah. killed him? Yeah. So he got yeah. scolded to death. Yeah, yeah. Well. But then he like wrapped himself up in plastic to, to go out and make this allegation. It was a weird, it was a whole weird thing, you know? So, uh, of course, so we're at the apartment, and it was Frank Sinatra's old apartment, like in the, in the upper 70s on the east side. Someday <laughs> when I'm awfully low. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> when the world is cold. <laughs> when the tub is cold. The tub is cold. The tub is cold. Yeah. So, uh, so, of course, everybody wants to go in. It's like you know, big new, big media case and all this stuff, right? So I got uh, one of my detectives. He was he was a hair bag, you know, in, in the crime scene unit. I love him. Yeah, right? yeah, he, he was the hair bag. He was always, hair bags talk out of the side of the mouth. What, this is what I think is going on. Yeah, yeah. So so all these. Uh, it turns out, so Dr. Cox, like the young Dominican boys, he used to go down to the DR with bottles of 100 milligram Viagra jars of the thing. Right? That, that was his vacation. So he had condoms. Was it C O X or C O C K S? His last name. <laughs> yeah, it's the phonetic works just fine, you know. So uh, 
so we get this. Uh, so I got uh, my detective Joe. He's he's a character, you know. He was uh, he would just speak his mind all the time. So all these chiefs are walking around. Hey, what do we got here? And so he says to this chief, says to Joe, so what do you think? What, what are you going to do next? And there were boxes of condoms. He goes, well, chief. He goes, first thing we should do is run all the serial numbers on those condoms. <laughs> and he goes, oh, there's serial numbers on condoms. He goes. I guess he never had to roll it down that far, huh, Chief? <laughs> I'm like, all right, John, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, it took him a minute. And he's Very like, funny, mm, detective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, all right, listen. You'll be now. working in Staten Island tomorrow morning. <laughs> and pull out the camera and that's aim it right, at the chief. That's right. Wait a minute. <laughs> Get back. No patrol yeah. with all that knowledge. Right in summonses. What Staten you, Island. Where did you? One, one two, oh, Adam. That's where you used to work. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Classic. So, uh, what else can we ask you, man? Let, let me ask some. How often do you go out on these forensics for all jobs? Do you get steady work for real? With that? For, for real. real? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, forensics right. for real. Yeah, yeah. How often uh, do you get hired for that? To, to do, I, I get calls all the time. You know, uh, I'm actually wanting to slow down a little bit. Most of the. What do you say all the time? Once a week? Once a month? Uh, well, it depends. Yeah, I guess maybe one, a couple of. What months, are you getting you know? called out for? Well, uh, this company. It's it's rare it's rare for me to get a crime scene, you know, uh, especially crime scene, you know, that's not totally already been processed. Right. You know, how many uh, lasers are you getting? Those 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 filmed crime scene now. Are you getting a lot of those? Yeah, do, I don't. Do you, do you get I called to uh, evaluate them? I, ha I have a guy for that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know how the police department was compartmentalized? Yes. Like, for, if I get a uh, like a Leica scan. Or a Faro scan. I have a guy for that. That's that's his. You don't want to that's do his, all, everything. I yeah. can't. can't I, well, I I am incapable. Of that. You know, that's like when I go to a scene, I, I like strings and all that stuff, and I like to. But but for me, it's like if you can't do it the old fashioned way, you shouldn't have a machine that does this stuff for you because you can actually use those machines and reconstruct the impact angle of a bullet. You could do things like that. But if you don't understand how to do it with who a does, string and well, a rod, who would and stuff do your like ballistics that, you know? work? I do my I do all that. You do your own ballistics yeah, work? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, impact. You know, I mean, the the amazing thing about ballistics, people don't realize there's so many areas on the bullet that can be identified. You got the, uh, where the primer mark, right? Where the uh, yeah. hits, right? Firing pin impression. You got firing pin impression, right? You got the um, tool marks on the shell that when it ejects the shell, right? What's that called? Yeah, the, there's the uh, extractor, extractor mark, and then there's also marks. an ejector mark. And then yeah. you have the... Um, Breach face. The... Uh, the obviously bu uh, ballistic stuff on the bullet, on the, the bullet. sides of the bullet. Yeah, I can't even think what that's called anymore because I'm having a brain fart. It. Yeah, it's the lands and grooves, right? The lands and grooves, that stuff. Yeah. So there's many things to look at, and yeah. not everyone uh, realizes that, you know. And then even, and sometimes in the rarest occasion, you can pull a fingerprint off a shell, right? But very rare, though. Yeah, right? that, there's all kinds of new stuff coming out with that now. I mean, it's 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 been done. It's very uh, it's a very difficult thing because when you speaking know, of new stuff. Uh, we wanted to talk about the facial recognition. I promised our audience that we'd ask you about that. And also about these things, uh, 23andMe, yeah. Ancestry.com. Mm -hmm. Let's start off with that one. Well, what's okay. your opinion on these, uh, sending your DNA to these companies? Uh, well, if you're if you're wanted for an offense where you probably left your DNA at the crime scene, don't do it, right? Like, <laughs> what about if I your mean, families, though? Your family. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a whole familial search and all that kind of stuff that can be done. I mean... Uh, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of defense work, but I'm, my heart's still a cop in, in, in the police department. I, you know, I, I think it's an excellent resource mm -hmm. uh, for law enforcement to get information from. You know, uh, I, so I'm, I'm like really if I had an uncle that was annoying, you know, he was like always over the house, eating us out of house and home, <laughs> borrowing money. I know he does. He's done some bad things. I might go. I might send a swab in and be like, "Oh, you might want. You might, you might want to try to match this up with this guy, Hector. Hector, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> Just to get him out of the house, you know. Right, right. I wouldn't be surprised if that's not going to happen in, in the in the future. If people just giving up their family. Yeah, yeah you never know. Just to get him out of the house, just to get him out of the way. It's mm -hmm. annoying sometimes. But these people are. Uh, they drain you, man. They drain the whole, they bring down the whole family. Let them take a vacation for a little while. Give me some peace. So you don't think it's a good idea, right? What to, to send your DNA to the government? I mean, to um, to these companies. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, there's there's two there's a couple sides to it, right? Um, 
I think it's an interesting thing what they're doing, and and the bigger the database gets, the more information they're they're going to be able to give you know to to you as a client, right? right? So the more people in the world that submit their DNA. The, the larger the database and the more they're going to say, oh, guess what? You guys are all from the same region over here. And it's like, so, so to discourage people from doing it. Um, I think medically it's, it's interesting because if you have um, some, a pattern in your family for cancer, for example, and now you discover through your DNA, well, that's obvious. And I, or maybe you didn't know it. Now, preventative care, obviously, you get you get a, a leg up on that. You get to take an advantage of that. Okay, I, sh- I need to avoid this. Hmm. You know, that's going to be really interesting, uh, getting a chart of things that you should avoid because otherwise they're going to trigger um, this type of health stuff. And I would imagine if you follow that regimen and can prove it, you'll probably get re- big reductions in your medical insurance. Yeah, that's a good and point. And stuff like that. Yeah. If, if you're one of the people that... Yeah, but there's people the out clear, there that do know? it, man. Yeah. I see people getting up. It's like Sunday morning. It's 6.40 in the morning. It's You already know it's going to be 120 degrees today, but you got to go out and run, you fucking asshole. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. Really, you mother... You probably take the day off when it's 120. Those, I God think, forbid right? you miss a day, you machine. <laughs> that's the point of living life, man. All right, let's talk about facial recognition. Yeah, that's, that's a that's a big thing now. Yeah, that's a little outside of my area. Like, I'm not a tech guy. I'm not. But now I'm that you see guy, that, yeah, you know, knowing what you knew in crime scene and stuff like that, and and the fact that you mentioned that it was part of a case. Which case were you talking about? Where they wound up uh, doing some facial recognition? You mentioned it earlier. Well, they did oh, you, the uh, Boston Marathon. Yeah, Boston thing. Marathon. Oh yeah, the Boston yeah. Marathon yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. The Zonaev brothers were identified through um, social networks. Look at that sites. face app. That face app. People are like, oh, it's so funny. Look at how yeah. I look old. Yeah. First of all, I'm already getting old. I don't want to see how much older I don't I'm going to look. Oh, yeah, what happened with that? Was that some sort of a spy no, thing or something like that? They're saying the Russians put that up there Who knows? so they can Who knows, affect right? the next election. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, what's but now they have you when you look the way you look now, and they're going to have you... That we can already project how you're going to look when you're older. You send us your DNA. We know where you fall politically because of your social media. Um, yeah. We know your family, your friends. I didn't expect to live this long, you know, so I don't give a damn what I live. If I'm still here in 20 years, it's say, hey, all right. We know. made it We so. made it through the 80s and the 90s on the police department <laughs> in the yeah. 2000s. Yeah. That's right. unbelievable. We made it alone. Yeah. We stepped out more or less unscathed, except we have... PTSD, all of us. Yeah. How often yeah. do you work? Like, what is it? What does a work week look like for you? Do you uh, work every day? Yeah, you work? yeah. I got casework I could do every every single day. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, but you know how it is. Like, when it's the same thing with the police department. You get, uh, I get a job that comes in, and right away I got to start doing all my work, all my analysis. Uh, a lot, of, most of the time, it's just photos. You know, uh, a lot of times I'll go look at the physical evidence, and, and uh, I use some of my little trick photography, my my uh, infrared, and all that kind of stuff, and w- whatever. It depends. Some people don't want you touching it. Some people let you do whatever you want to it. You know, they'll, they'll give you a bag here. This is yours. You know, they, you got no clean place to lay it out on. So I always bring my own right. rolls of paper and stuff to preserve the integrity of the evidence. So, they got butcher so, paper in the car too. This yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. I got, I got all kinds of well, stuff. Butcher we, talk, paper. we talked about that when yeah. you got cleaver. When you got drug tested <laughs> on the police department, they put your leg on a f- f- smelly brown paper bag oh, yeah, of shit, right? Yeah. To shave oh, the yeah, yeah, to shave your hair. Oh, that's clean. That's forensically. There could be cocaine on that piece of brown paper. And that's where you, that's my career right there, that's right? That's so funny. <laughs> I had one of my detectives. He, he was a character, right? He, he's going bald, you know. And uh, so they're like, where do you want us to take the hair from? You know, your, your legs or your head? And he goes, listen, he goes, uh, I'm losing most of my hair already, so please don't take it from my head. And he goes, and I have a boat, so I'm out there. So I really don't want you shaving my legs. He goes, uh, but my wife tells me I got, I got a hairy ass. So, uh, <laughs> and so, she, so she's laughing, right? And he goes... I'm serious. And this guy was good. You know how some guys, like, they can just... They, yeah, you can keep a straight face. Yeah. And so, uh, so she goes and she kind of, like, walks away into, like, the supervisor's office and the door closes. And it was about, he said it was about three or four minutes later, the boss just opens the door and he yells out, no ass hair, and he slams the door. <laughs> I had some oh, detective man. shaving my legs, and I was busting his balls. Doing, like, you really like your job, you little yeah. bucket? You know? <laughs> the guy, the guy who uh, we had a, a sergeant that used to do it for housing, right? And and uh, he goes, uh, he goes, yeah, I wanted a detail. I asked for a detail, and they said you're in. And he goes, but I thought they said you're in, but it was urine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and whenever you step up to the to the oh, to God. the thing, he goes. 
He goes, he hands you the cup. He goes, at first, you're going to feel a small prick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they take the hair, though, they don't finish shaving the leg. No, they just keep it and all. And they do they it in like three disgusting. or four different spots yeah. on one leg. So now if it's the middle of the summer and you go into the beach, you look like there's something wrong with you. Yeah, you right, definitely right. do, man. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, that leg looks, uh, wow, that doesn't look good. You got patches of hair missing. What's the matter with you? So now you, you have to shave tested. You have to shave both legs. Yeah. And then your chest and your arms. Yeah, it's my excuse. Yeah, me too. <laughs> your ass. <laughs> wow, this was great, man. I can't believe the second hour this went was so, so fast. Really yeah, man. Was, yeah, it's, it's been, been great, great, man. Thank you, John, guys. man, thanks for coming by. Thank you very you know, much. I think all, to listeners, have you back. all listeners are getting a plethora, I learned that word in college years mm -hmm. ago, of, of different points of view in the police service and prosecution and it's pretty damn interesting i'd have to say but before we go one more question do you have a lot of girls that ask you to, to either follow <laughs> their husbands or their boyfriends or they bring you some of their something that and they want you to like collect dna off of it no, I don't get it. that's that's uh that, Well you will now I, I'm a licensed PI. <laughs> We're gonna make sure that the guy, his name is John Pellucci. He'll take all the when underwear you, you wanna send him. You're in What's bar, your address you again? Talk loudly about being a crime scene investigator. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I would no, imagine that so you had a ton of women that like, I don't trust my husband for nothing. This is his brush. I, I, I bet you there's hairs from his girlfriend in here too, or something like that. I would imagine you, you know, your pockets test, filled with alcohol prep pads. <laughs> <laughs> If you're a current law enforcement and you happen to pull this gentleman over, all that stuff in his car is for crime scenes, okay? That's right. There's a legitimate not a serious, He's it's not a serial killer. killer. <laughs> well, uh, Bill, any parting words? That, again, that this was great. It's a lot of fun. And uh, as Mark was saying, we're hoping um, our audience is picking up every week. We're getting a bigger and bigger audience. And uh, we're hoping to be picked up. And shortly we're thinking we're going to go national. And that's going to happen. And we'll once we, once we... Have a confirmation. We'll let that cat out of the bag. But all you people have been listening week to week. Thank you so much for being yeah, fans Thanks. of Police Off the Cuff. If you're out in a radio car somewhere, it's 95 degrees. You one day could become a crime scene detective and be in a bloody, smelly, filthy apartment at 95 In a Tyvek degrees. suit. In a Tyvek yeah. suit with alcohol prep pads loaded in your pockets. Sweating bullets. Well, before, one more time, I just want to mention, uh, what is that? RTFoundation.com. Is it .com? Does it say that? How about the back? Does this say anything? Yeah, it says uh, rtfoundationnj.org. Oh, yeah. rtfoundationnj.org. Rt I looked that up online. It's a great foundation. They, uh, they help uh, um, veteran families, people who have lost um, uh, members of uh, the armed forces in battle and stuff like that. And they make donations. They look for volunteers as well to help other families like that. They connect people who have actually lost... Uh, lost family members, and they're, they're doing a great job out there. And uh, for those of you who have um, foundations and stuff like that, and you have T-shirts, you know, send them over. We'll get you an address soon. We will take any type of clothing. I wear a double X. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Joe, uh, I'm John, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming down. Oh, John, I thought this, are you Italian? See, si. you speak Italian. Oh, I thought you were yeah, a little bit. I thought well, it was so Irish. Can, they can hire you in Rome. They can yeah. do all those Vatican cases. What's the, what's the furthest you ever gone? Yeah. Shit. Uh, yeah. What's the furthest you've ever traveled? To? I, I went to Paraguay and exhumed a body down there. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was. I, I got a call from a lawyer. Says I need a DNA expert. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm not a scientist. What do you need? I need somebody to exhume a body down in Paraguay and uh, collect DNA. And, and collect the DNA. And I'm like, I'm your man. And then I'm on a computer. Where the fuck is Paraguay? <laughs> I'm like, I know it's South America, but do I bring a bathing suit? Or, yeah, you know, yeah, like, definitely. What, what I, like mountain climbing gear. What do I need? There's somebody know? from there. They're, they got a soccer team too. They're in the World Cup all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. all the Carabinieri in uh, Italy and uh, what's the, the other ones? The Polizia? Yeah, so yeah Carabinieri, yeah. Uh, I have good friends in the Carabinieri, yeah. yeah. The military yeah. arm of the police, Yeah, right? I'd like to shout out to my Carabinieri friends. I'm going to send this shout, over shout to them, out, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Whenever you have one of these things where you have to travel and you need somebody to carry all this stuff, the cleaver, the butcher paper. I want to go to Venice. What's the best restaurant? OTA. You, you only get 150 an hour for that, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I'll do it for a lot less, What's man. your company called Forensics for Free? What is it called? Again? <laughs> Forensics for real. Number four. Oh, yeah. For, okay. yeah, for yeah, free yeah. for us. It's OTA. Yeah, for free. For yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, man. On behalf of uh, Police Off the Cuff, uh, that's another. Uh, we are end the tour here. Excellent. Thank you. Peace out. Come back and visit again. Yeah. <laughs>